So welcome everybody to our last uh, talk by Aaron Lauder about lattice models arising from non-semisimple DQT. Thank you, Anna. Um, you know, as I was preparing for this talk and I was packing up my stuff to come here, I have a file folder where I keep all my notes from talks that I've given and I was trying to clear room so I had some room to bring things here. I was taking out all these talks and it was just amazing that all the talks I could see like Jones polynomial. Jones, and it was just sort of, it just made me really step back and realize just how influential Vaughn's work was. Um, it's really amazing. So for me, it's a big honor to be invited to speak at this conference in honor of him. Um, he really did some great work. And what I want to talk about today is actually related to the last conversation or last exchange I had with Vaughn, which was about some work he had done. Um, you know, there's always this, one of the things we love about the Jones polynomial and, and this quantum topology is this breadth and the way that it interchanges with so many fields, in particular um, physics. So he had this paper with uh, a Haranov and Landau where they write down a, a quantum, an explicit algorithm for running on a quantum computer to compute the Jones polynomial in polynomial time. And that's kind of interesting. This, this originally sort of is implied by some work of Friedman and a, a bunch of collaborators, but they actually wrote down explicitly for the Jones polynomial how to compute it in polynomial time on a quantum computer. And what's interesting is that problem is what's called BQP complete. So it means that any problem that can be computed on a, on a quantum computer in polynomial time is equivalent to computing Jones polynomials. So we're basically, you know, when we're computing all these Jones polynomials, we're basically, you know, calculating any, any useful problem on a quantum computer. It's pretty impressive. So I was talking to him about generalizing that. But this is a, a little bit of a different direction. The talk today is about um, some further interactions between uh, quantum topology and quantum physics. So specifically what I'm going to talk about is how state sum TQFTs in three dimensions connect to these models that certain physicists have been looking at, uh, Kataev and Levin-Wen models. The way that I'm going to present it, in the end, I think you're going to find that this connection is going to seem like, well, yeah, of course there's this connection. Um, but the way it's presented in the physics literature, it's a lot less obvious that it's how the TQFT is really controlling what's going on. Levin and Wen were sort of interested in how to take things like strings, like little not like strings of, in a plane, and how these things could condense to form different kinds of particles. So like not only bosons and fermions, but that they could, in, in some unified framework, you could have just little knotted strings emerging with uh, bosons, fermions, and even more exotic particles, anions, that would have fractional braiding statistics. So throughout this talk, um, sorry, so, wrong way. So Kataev, Kataev and levin Wynn is they're, they're the same, basically. People prove this after the fact. Kataev is based on like Hopf algebras. levin Wynn is based on uh, modular categories, so that, you know, the category of representations, et cetera. Um, so what this talk is about is just generalizing this idea of these quantum mechanical models and their connection to TQFT to this new, new setting of non-semi-simple TQFT. So this started off as a project where I was trying to learn about this cool new work in non-semi-simple uh, three-manifold invariants, of which I should say that this audience probably, I mean, comprises many of the, the original people and the people who know this far better than I do. So I encourage those non-semi-simple people to pipe up when I screw something up at various points. I'll just give one bit of warning. I'm going to mostly be talking about the non-semi-simple Turaya-Vero invariant. But a lot of the work that's been done is really for non-semi-simple Reshetik and Turayev. So we'll, I'll try to explain what I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the applications of Reshetik and Turayev side, but this talk is really about the Turayev Vero. And, and so the reason that this kind of connection was interesting was that these the Kataev and Levin-Wen models gave these uh, models where you could do like quantum memory or approaches to what's called topological quantum computing. And topological quantum computing is interesting because it's, it's, a, it's an approach to trying to do quantum computing that's going to be tolerant to these errors that, you know, part of the problem with quantum computers is that they interact with the environment and destroy your, you know, your coherence or your superpositions. So this fault, this uh, topological quantum computing was an idea to try to um, get something there, your quantum states would be a little more stable. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. So, before I go, I want to talk about some of the advantages of the non-semi-simple TQFTs. 
so that you can understand why this problem on the previous page might be interesting. So there was already this sort of interesting story between Taraya Vero and Levin Wen models. And so why might we expect that non-semi-simple TQFTs would give something interesting on the physics side? And so to explain, I want to talk a little bit about some of the applications. So as we go through the talk, I'm going to restrict to just talking about Taraya Vero. All of these applications were proven in the Reshetik and Taraya setting. So let me just preface that. The, the, the Taraya Vero setting was proven with uh, Blanche, with Gear, Paderov, Mirand, and Taraev. But this non-semi-simple TQFT for Reshetik and Taraev, that was with uh, Blanche. I'm going to quit putting all these like lawyer corrections. So if, I, if, if you're an expert and you were in this area, please correct me if, if something is egregious. But I'll, I'll quit commenting on the differences between those different TQFTs. So why is the non-semi-simple theory interesting if you're in the business of TQFTs? Well, the, the state spaces are a little bit, you, can, you get more flexibility in creating the state spaces. In other words, our Hilbert spaces, we have a lot more flexibility in what kind of Hilbert spaces we can use. And these TQFTs are just better. So the non-semi-simple theory can distinguish lens spaces. There's a known result like the normal Reshetik and Taraev based on a semi-simple category. Those don't distinguish lens spaces. But um, using you know, some older work and also connecting this new work to the older work, it's able to show that these can distinguish. I know Yosef, did, did, this actually connects into Yosef's work at some point. Um, so unlike the semi-simple theory, you also get um, infinite mapping class group representation. So the Dane twist for normal Reshetik and Taraev has finite order. But in the non-semi-simple theory, this Dane twist has infinite order. Now, I'm going to get a little bit into it as we go, but a lot of these topological operations, like even go, going back to this work of Friedman, these topological operations are very much connected to the kinds of things you can do in the quantum computing world. So having a Dane twist, which is infinite order, is going to tell you that these already these, uh, you have more information in this non-semi-simple setting than you had in the semi-simple setting. So these are just a couple of the things that are better about non-semi-simple TQFTs. I hope this slide convinces you that, I, <laughs> when I give this slide, sometimes I think, well, why the heck was anyone thinking about Reshetik and Taraev? It's like, it can't tell lens spaces, but you know, obviously we all like Reshetik and Taraev invariants, and those, those gave us a lot of interesting things. I hope this slide convinces you that the non-semi-simple theory is even more interesting. So the thing we're trying to connect this with on the physics side is something called a topological phase. And this is basically just a quantum mechanical system um, so we have uh, a bunch of spins. Um, I mean, in general, our spins are going to be labeled by the simple objects of some category. But um, we have a Hamiltonian on this system that has a bunch of nice properties. So it's gapped. And that just means that there's a finite energy uh, difference between the ground states and the excited state. So it's not like a continuous spectrum. The Hamiltonian doesn't have a continuous spectrum. Uh, it's a local Hamiltonian where the, the Hamiltonian basically breaks up into a bunch of operators which just act locally on um, specific sets of spins, so neighboring spins. It's not acting on the whole thing at once. And then in the limit of, you know, in some limits and zero temperature, the quantum mechanical system has a ground state, which is degenerate, meaning the ground state is uh, some, you know, vector space. And the ground state is actually a topolo is topological degeneracy. So it only depends, there's, there's no local perturbations that you can do that's going to change this degenerate ground state. And one of the things that's interesting in these topological phases is that often there are ex the, the first excite, so you're at your ground state and then you look at like what happens at the next excited state. Those excitations act like quasi-particles and by moving those excitations around you can create particles that braid. And for, for us, you know, braiding is obviously exciting um, for the physicists also. So I'm going to get more into all of these topics. I just want to have a big picture of what our goal was. So the goal is to connect non-semi-simple TQFT to topological phases. So before we do it, I want to tell you about the usual story, because I just learned it somewhat recently over the past year, and I found it to be very beautiful. So I'm going to do like a lightning review of Taraya just sort of covering the things that we care about. So Taraya Vero, you can build, it's a state sum. You, you triangulate a three-manifold. You sum over all ways of coloring it by simple objects of some category. And your category has to have some nice properties. So the properties that I want to highlight here are um, quantum dimension, 
Uh, so you have a way of, or sorry, you have a trace. So any map that goes from some object to itself, you can close it off. And the, the right trace is equal to the left trace. That's what makes the category pivotal. Um, using that, we can take the trace of the identity matrix and define a notion called a quantum dimension. And these spherical categories are sufficiently nice that this quantum dimension is actually going to always be real. And furthermore, it's actually going to always be positive. So that's one of the nice things about these um, spherical categories. And then key to the uh, Turaya-Vero construction, you need to have some nice object to associate to a tetrahedron in your triangulation. So you need some object that has the symmetries of a tetrahedra and um, you know, nice properties like that. It has to depend on six indices. These are the, uh, related to the edges in the tetrahedron, the faces, edges in the tetrahedron. Um, so we have these things called 6J symbols, which you can actually interpret as this uh, value of this graph that I've drawn here. Yeah, for now. Not, I won't say always, because as soon as we get to non-semi-simple, I won't. But yeah. So for now, my categories, yeah, that, I should mention that. These spherical categories, they have a fine, they're semi-simple. I should have emphasized the semi-simplicity. They're semi-simple, finite number of simple objects. Left trace equals right trace. And that, that's the setting that normal Turaya Vero takes place in. So what is a Turaya Vero model? Like I said, you take your three manifold, you triangulate it, you fix some labeling by simple objects on the boundary, and uh, you look at the 6J symbol. So for each way of coloring, each way of labeling all the edges of my, tetra of my triangulation, I can uh, get a 6J symbol. And then the tri Vero invariant is just a big sum over all those 6J symbols that I get by coloring all the edges. My formula is like a little screwed up. There should be one, there should be something here for the boundary terms like a square root of D, but I just wanted to give you the flavor of it. This dimension of the category is like some sum of squares of norms of all these dimensions. So it's just some factor that depends on this quantum dimension. So we sum over all ways of labeling the three mana, the triangulation, keep the boundary labels fixed, because you fix those, sum over all ways of labeling, stick in some factor of this quantum dimension for every edge that's not on the boundary, and then take the product of those uh, 6J symbols for every way that we colored. That's the invariant. Well, that's the definition. And then the theorem of Triaviro is that this is a topological invariant. Okay, so how do you prove that something on a triangulation is an invariant? You show it's invariant under the Pachner moves. And the Pachner moves, these things are just ways of moving between like any two triangulations of the same three manifold. So they, there's the, the two, three move, which looks like this. I tried to draw some pictures so that you could kind of, if you haven't, either you've seen these before and it's very familiar or you haven't. I tried to make it a little more clear here where I've exploded the different tetrahedra. So, this is a relation that says something about two tetrahedron. So whatever my 6J symbols are with these two tetrahedron should be the same as these three tetrahedron. And the reason that this relation holds is actually related to the associator in the category that we started with. So to do this triavira, we started with a semi-simple or a spherical category. Part of that data is an associator. And the reason that this axiom holds is because of that. There's also this 1-4 move, which is a little easier, at least for me, to imagine what's happening. You're like subdividing the tetrahedra. So you're taking 1 into 4 tetrahedra. And I just want to, like, what property of the category is this related to? This forces the category to be semi-simple. So the reason that you have to have a semi-simple category is because of the 1-4 move. If you want to be invariant under 1-4 move, you're semi-simple. So if you're not, <laughs> if you're not invariant, if you're... <laughs> I mean, if you don't satisfy the 1-4 move, it's impossible to satisfy the 1-4 move while being not semi-simple. Semi-simplicity is intrinsic property of the 1-4 move. So this is something we're going to have to deal with as we go through and talk about the non-semi-simple theory. So that's the Turaya Vero theory. How does the Turaya Vero produce a topological phase? How are we going to build some quantum mechanical system out of Turaya Vero theory? So the way you do it is you fix some surface. So now we're just talking about two dimensions. Forget about the third dimension for now. We live on some surface. And we triangulate it. And we look at the dual graph of the triangulation. So this is going to be where our, uh, our spins live. They're going to live on the edges of this dual graph. And you know, if we were, if we were like 
Uh, some of the physicists like to just like fix a honeycomb lattice or something like very regular to where you can write down nice formulas. We don't need to do that. Just take any dual graph. We're going to label the edges with, with uh, we're going to label, fix some spherical category with a set of simple objects. And we're going to form a local Hilbert space so that the Hilbert space of each edge is just going to be C to the N where N is the number of simple objects. So basically it's just the vector space spanned by the set of simple objects, each edge. And then I can get a basis for this vector space by just saying, uh, like picking a simple object. And I'll use this physics notation with the kets to say like, I is the, is the simple object V sub I. So this is a nice basis for my each edge. And then my, my total, oh weird, okay. Uh, the total Hilbert space is just gonna be the product or the direct, I think that should be a tensor product. <laughs> tensor product over all edges. So you, you define this local Hilbert space, then you just take the big tensor product over all the different edges. That's your Hilbert space. So it's just a bunch of copies of the free vector space on the set of simple objects for every single edge. And then we're gonna have a, our, our preferred basis for this Hilbert space is where we basically just choose a simple object for every edge. So if I choose a simple object on every single edge, that's gonna be a basis vector in this Hilbert space. And I want to have a rule that um, this orientation, there's a way to get this orientation from the triangulation, but let's just assume the, the dual graph is arbitrarily oriented. I need the rule that if I reverse the orientation, I switch uh, the simple object to its dual. So that the, these spherical categories have the property that um, for every simple VI, VI dual is some other simple object. So there's an involution on the set of simple objects. Okay, so now, okay, so that's, we just, we got our Hilbert space, that's it. We're, we're, off to, we're off to the races. I just make these states be orthonormal. I have a Hilbert space. Now to do quantum mechanics, I better define a, Hil a Hamiltonian. I need to put a Hermitian operator on this Hilbert space. So I'm gonna work up to that. Before I do that, I'm gonna tell you some other operators on this Hilbert space. So there's these vertex operators it just, they sound cooler than they are. They're, they're, they're just, they take in a state and spit out a delta function where if this branching is allowed, in other words, if, if hom in the category from one into this tensor product is non-zero, it spits out the identity. And if it is zero, it spits out zero. So on a given state like this, it just acts by either zero or one. It acts by one if this is a good branching or zero if it's a bad branching. And of course, if I, like that rule that I told you on the previous slide, if any of these edges are going the other way, I just switch VI with VI dual and, and, and it just, so there's a, that, that's, that's some operators that we can put on this Hilbert space. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'm assuming, for this talk, I'll assume multiplicity one, but there's no, nothing in principle about doing the higher multiplicity case. It's just the bookkeeping gets more. Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. So one thing that's interesting, or I just wanna point out, these operators are projectors. It's pretty obvious if I do them twice, I either, you know, I'm gonna get the identity, or I'm gonna get back the same thing as doing it once. Uh, they're mutually commuting. If I do a delta function on this vertex, a delta function on that vertex, they commute, it doesn't matter. So one thing that I wanna comment on is that if you look at the simultaneous, um, plus one eigenstates of all of these operators. So the place where all of these operators have, they're projectors, right? All of these, so projectors have eigenstates plus one and zero. So if I take the simultaneous plus one eigenspace, the place where all the QVs act by one, that's gonna be the space of ribbon graphs on this, on this surface. Um, so I just wanna highlight that. So we're, we're, even though we're kind of trying to talk quantum mechanically, we're just still doing topology. These are just ribbon graphs on the surface. At least the plus one eigenstates are the Rubin graphs. There's also lots of states in this system where these branching rules are not satisfied. So there's these weird labelings as well. Okay, these are the little bit more interesting operators. These are called plaquette operators. So remember, we're, we're working on the dual graph here. So this used to be a vertex and this used to be part of my triangulation, but I'm working with the dual graph. So a plaquette is just like a region that's enclosed in your dual graph. And we're gonna define some operators associated to each plaquette. Uh, I'm gonna do it in steps, 
So the first thing I'm going to do is define a, a, a different operator that depends on a specific choice of simple object. So you t the, one way of explaining it is to take your plaquette and insert an S-colored loop inside of it. That's one way to describe it. Because you see, in the, t in the spherical category, if I have like VI tensor VJ, that VI tensor VJ factors through a sum over all the other simples. So you get this relation that says two vertical lines is equal to a sum of merge, split. So I can do that on all these like uh, uh, parallel strands here, turn those into a bunch of merge splits, use some relations in the spherical category, do a bunch of stuff, and what you actually get is this, here's an example on a triangle. If I had done a more complicated, I would have, for every side, I would have a copy of D and a copy of F. Why are the associators showing up? Well, when you do this computation, so basically what happens is you, you start with this loop, you do a bunch of relations, and eventually you can get back to where the loop is gone, but you've changed all the labels around the boundary. So all these J's get changed to different labels, the K's stay fixed, and in the process of simplifying, you have to use the associator a bunch, one for each edge, and that's, that's part of why all these F symbols show up. So in the, in the Levin Wen paper, <laughs> They write this. This is the formula. There's no justification. Um, it's a lot easier to tell some of the properties when you think about it like this. And I'll argue there's an even better way of thinking about these operators on the next slide. Any questions before we go on? OK, so we're working up to defining, we're just defining a bunch of operators on our Hilbert space. So the operator BP, the one that I'm the most interested in, is going to be a sum over all those simple objects of some quantum dimension, so this, this quantum dimension is showing up here, times the plaquette operator labeled by S. So, so if you go back to the previous slide, sum over all S of simple objects in the middle here with a normalization of the quantum dimension of S. Now, the key insight, which I learned from this paper by Cooperberg and uh, collaborators that, was on the, that I mentioned when I started this slide, this operator BP is something very simple if you're a quantum topologist. It's exactly what the tri of Vero invariant would give you if I look, so this is back to the original graph. Remember, we were work, a plaquette corresponds to a vertex in the original triangulation. So here's my vertex, add a new vertex right above it, connect it to all the neighbors by an edge. Now I have a bunch of tetrahedra. And what I do is I just say, what does Terraya Vero give me for this, this, you know? So now whatever the label was on this interior edge, after I apply the Terraya Vero map, like think of it as going from the bottom to the top, this new edge is gonna have a different label. And that different label is exactly what we saw on this previous thing. So like if you look here, I started with something labeled, <laughs> I started with something labeled J3, and then over here it's J3 prime. And so it's changed, the label changed as I went. The same thing's happening here um, when we apply tri of zero. And what's cool is that the, when you have this topological interpretation, a lot of properties of these operators become totally obvious. For example, these operators are, com they commute with one another. How do I know that? Well. Doing BP2 or BP1 is like stick a vertex above P1, connect it to its neighbors. Then BP2, stick a vertex above P2 and connect it to its neighbors. Notice in this, this way, P1 prime is one of his neighbors. If I do it the other way, I get a different uh, triangulation. But what I'm getting is two different triangulations of the same surface, <laughs> this ball. So I've got two different triangulations. Why are those operators commuting? Well, triangulation independence of tri of zero says that those two things are equal. So I have these commuting. And I also know that these things um, are projectors. And again, why is that? Because if I stick two balls over my triangulation, that's the same thing as sticking one ball by triangulation independence. So I've, I've built you some mutually commuting projectors for every single plaquette which from the perspective of Terraya Vero is totally obvious that these things are gonna commute and be projectors just by topological properties. So then we're basically done. Our Hamiltonian is gonna be defined on that space of uh, what are, you know, we call those string nets, those, the dual graphs labeled by the simple objects. 
So take that Hilbert space of all possible labelings of the dual graph by simple objects and define this Hamiltonian. I've stuck in these ones here so that it will have the property that um, the ground state of the system is when all of the operators have their plus one eigenstates. Remember, when you have a projector, the eigenstates are zero or one. So when every single operator in town has a plus one eigenstate, the ground state will be zero. We'll have zero energy and then everything else, every single other excitation will be like integer, positive integer. So this, the spectrum of this Hamiltonian looks like the positive integers. Because um, as whenever BP is zero, I get one contribution to the energy. Um, and the theorem is that, okay, this theorem is gapped. It's gapped because there's clearly a, a gap between zero and one, right? Like each excitation is, is, is one unit higher. So it's gapped. It's local. Each of these plaquette and vertex operators is acting on only a, a local set of spins. Um, it's exactly solvable and it's what's called a commuting projector Hamiltonian because it's defined by a bunch of commuting projectors. These have some especially nice properties. And one thing that I should mention, I mean, we're doing quantum mechanics, so when you learn, the first thing you learn is like, oh, your Hamiltonian, it needs to be Hermitian in order to have, you know, real eigenvalues and, you know, so that where you can make sense of probabilities and things like that. So to prove that this Hamiltonian is Hermitian, you actually have to have a unitary or, or Hermitian semi-simple category, actually unitary. So there's this idea about unitary TQFTs when you're working with one of those, then you can use that to show that your Hamiltonian is, is Hermitian. And it's a, it's a not too difficult computation using the structure of the, the Hermitian structure on the category. And before I, before I do that, let me just ask at this point if there's any questions. So, so to define quantum mechanics, I need a Hilbert space, I need a Hamiltonian, we've defined both of those from Turaya Vero theory. And the way I present it is kind of, I don't know how your impression is, but to me it seems kind of like, yeah, that's, it's not that cool. Like, you just built a quantum mechanical system that's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's not, I'm not that impressed. So if you're not impressed, don't worry, I'm not impressed either. But I mean, these Levin-Wen models and, and Kataev codes, I mean, there's a lot of literature about this. It's, they, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do in this setting. Like, once you start thinking about Turaya Vero is actually building a Hamiltonian in a, in a system for you. Um, That's true, but in this setting it would. Like, so you keep, I mean, you could subdivide your triangulation and keep subdividing to infinity and it'll still survive, right? Because, uh, it, like, th this, this remains gapped even in the limit of large system size. So, so yeah, that, I mean, that's an important point. Um, okay, so I don't know, I found this kind of cool. You take Turaya Vero, you build a, a, a Hamiltonian on a Hilbert space, that's kind of cool. But this, I, there's more properties that we want to talk about, right? Like what is this ground state? Does it have a topological degeneracy? Um, well, the ground state of this system is the place where everything in sight has a plus one eigenstate. I've already told you that the vertex operators, when those things have a plus one eigenstate, that's uh, ribbon graphs. So let's just assume that the Qs are all acting with their plus one eigenstate. So now, Every single dual graph is labeled by simple objects in such a way that the branching rules are satisfied everywhere. And then I just need these BPs to all be in the plus one eigenstate. So another way of saying that is that the ground state is exactly the place where the branching rules are satisfied and is in the image of this product of plaquette operators. So whatever the image of that operator is, that's the ground state. Well, let's think about this operator topologically. What does this operator do? Remember, each plaquette operator corresponds to taking a vertex, adding a new vertex above it, connecting it to all of its neighbors. But if I'm doing the product, I'm gonna do that for every single vertex. So if I do that for every single vertex, my picture starts to look like this. And what you see is I've just built a triangulated cylinder over my surface. So the ground state is, if we think back to this topological interpretation, the ground state, which is the image of all these plaquette operators, is just whatever the Turaya Vero assigns to a surface cross an interval. And for those that are familiar with state sums, uh, in the state sum world, you know, the, 
the boundary is not invariant because you, if you change the triangulation on the boundary, you get a different um, outcome. So the way that you get something that's actually an invariant or a TQFT on the surface level is you take the image of uh, an, a surface, uh, your surface cross an interval. That image of that operator is what Taraya Vero assigns to a surface. If you haven't thought about how state sums give, in, give actual TQFTs, usually we think of a state sum as giving an invariant of a three manifold. But if you want it to be actually like a, a TQFT and assign something to surfaces, you, you can't just take what it assigns to a given triangulation. That won't be an invariant. If you change the triangulation, you get a different answer. But if you take what Taraya Vero assigns to the surface cross an interval, take the image of that, that's always going to be topologically invariant. And that's exactly what our model is assigning. That's what the ground state of our model is. So we've built a theory where the ground state of our Hamiltonian is Taraya Vero. Again, the way I've described it is sort of you know, backwards from how it was introduced in the physics literature. This was the paper of Cooperberg where it was sort of, uh, Cooperberg and collaborators, where it was, where I learned that, oh, okay, now I see why it doesn't, it seems less, yeah. Go ahead, you can tell. No, no, uh, it doesn't depend on the triangulation anymore once you take the image of a cylinder. Because the cylinder is a projector, right? Like if I take a cylinder over a surface, and I, uh, and I do it twice, it, so it, it's projecting on, it, let's think about it in two dimensions. In, in two dimensions, if I do a state sum TQFT, I'm trying to, my, my boundary is a circle. So I can have one edge on my circle, or I can have two edges, or three edges, and if I have a, you know, th those, are, those are gonna be different answers, right? Like, so for each edge in the two dimensional case, I assign a vector space, so if I had uh, three edges, I would have A tensor three, if I had four, it would be A tensor four, but the cylinder is a projector that projects you from the A tensor, any number. It doesn't project you into A, it actually projects you into the center of A. That center is the thing which is gonna be the commutative Frobenius algebra. You don't even, yeah, you don't, I mean, it's, no, no, it's a projector, it's still a projection. I'll, I'll explain it slower after, but yeah, it, it's, it's a, it takes a little while to think about how to make a state sum into a TQFT, but. Yeah, that I talked, but I mean, if you want to, okay, yeah, let's go, yeah. okay. So anyways, the, try, hopefully we agree that the, what Taraya Vero assigns to a surface in a way to do, in a way that needs to be triangulation independent, so not like some fixed, if I want it to be completely triangulation independent, I need to take the image of a cylinder, and that's, that's exactly what the string that Hamiltonian's doing. That's the reason why your ground state is a topological invariant. So said from this way, I hope it doesn't seem so shocking that you get a topological phase from the tri of Vero. It should, it should feel very natural, such sort of thing. Um, so one thing that's cool about these things is that these Hamiltonians, the excitations in these models, like when, the, so that would correspond to a place where we're not in an eigenstate of BP, like where it's, where it's projecting onto zero. The excitations are gonna often have uh, abel non-abelian braiding statistics. Why is that? These, these excitations are kind of like punctures on the surface and in Taraya Vero, as we're braiding them, we're, you know, this is, it's just the braiding from our sphere, you know, from, uh, if we're working with the spherical category, it's technically the braiding coming from the double of the, the double of the spherical category is a modular tensor category. That modular tensor category has a braiding, and that's exactly, all these quasi-particles are basically labeled by simple objects of the double, and so that's why we see non-abelian uh, statistics showing up from these models. And I, I guess, you know, the key point is when C is unitary, braiding of these particles is also going to be unitary. And this is how, um, why people think they can use these for, quant for quantum computation. You take these excitations, braiding these excitations is a unitary operator. Well, if you can generate enough unitary operators, you can perform any, you know, you can perform any computation that you want. And the, the nice thing about these uh, topological braiding is that local perturbations aren't gonna change the ground state, this topological space. So when you're doing these different gates to do your computations, you're unlikely to get an error because the braiding is only sensitive to the topology. It doesn't care about the dynamics or geometry or anything like that. So this is, 
one, this is just trying to explain a big picture where topological quantum computing, topological phases come from tri zero theory. And then, so this, this is the story that we'll generalize now. Before I go on, is there any questions about this? Shoot, example. Uh, where do examples of these things come from? I've been talking about spherical categories and all that. It's a little abstract. The main, one of the best examples is SL2 at a root of unity, where you take the small quantum group where you know, e to the r, f to the r is zero. Uh, this thing is still a Hopf algebra. We study representations. I'm just kind of reviewing the standard sort. So if you were taking a TQFT course, I would say, yeah, you take the quantum group, you take the small quantum group, we're at a root of unity, and we look at the representations, the simple objects. You have these sort of well-known simple objects that you learn in representation theory, highest weight representations. You know, depending on what R is, as long as you pick some number smaller than R, you get these you know, simple representations that look like this. And they have quantum dimension, which is some you know, quantum integer. It's, it's a positive number. And what you do when you do Turaya-Vero theory is you just work with these representations. The, the simples Sn, where n is less than r, the labels that we use in our, of our triangulation, those are exactly those simple objects. But we have to do a little more work to this category of modules because there's all sorts of other modules in there that we don't want to use in triad Vero theory. What extra modules are in there? Well, there's these simple projective modules. See, because we're at a root of unity, um, I had it on the previous slide, Q to the lambda is the same as Q to the 2R lambda. So these weights of our representation, they really live in C mod 2RZ because every 2R I reset because of the uh, root of unity. Sorry. Yeah, I screw it up. What? Ah, okay, thank you. So, okay, even in the normal case, I need to choose a, a is 2R correct or? Oh, depending on n? Depending on the choice of the key. If you take a relative term, then you give n both and n. You have to choose the right one. I see. OK. All right. So if I'm careful with my root of unity, then this number will always be positive. Yes. OK. Thanks. Um, so there's these other modules that are kind of weird, or they only exist because you're at a root of unity. And they, you know, so I pick some weird complex number off, you know, alpha, way off in space. And I start acting by f on this vector. The thing is, normally this would just go on forever if I was in normal SL2 without a root of unity. But because of the root of unity, I eventually hit a vector where when I apply f, I get zero. So there's these highest weight vectors of high, of, uh, where I can generate these r-dimensional, where r was related to my root of unity. I can generate these r-dimensional um, representations. and the thing about these representations is that they all have quantum dimension zero. Um, so if you think back to the tri vero formula, that quantum dimension was showing up like all over the place. So you can see very quickly that we should not bother doing tri vero theory with these kind of modules because, well, for one, they have quantum dimension zero, so our tri vero invariant is zero. And the, another thing that's kind of an issue is that we, these things are always going to be simple as long as we're you know, away from the integers, um, at least in this range here. And one of the things you see is that there's an infinite number of these. So that would also be a problem. If we were trying to label the edges by an infinite number of objects, it would take us a long time. Uh, and so what Turaya Vero theory does is it just throws these things out. And, and we just build our theory with those SNs on the previous slide. We only use the simple objects. We, so we take a category, representations of the quantum group at a root of unity. That category has all these extra modules in it, these, these guys. And we say, well, let's throw all those guys away. And then whatever's left over, that's the category that we want to use for Turaya Vero theory. So this raises the question. I mean, you can see already that there's going to be a lot of issues if we want to build state sums from non-semi-simple TQFTs. So let's just highlight what are the problems. Well, I just said there's an infinite number of simple objects. So we're, you're not going to build a state sum that's going to converge or make sense if you're labeling every edge by an infinite number of objects. 
So there's, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but there's some idea of adding a grading to the category and using a cohomology class to help you select a finite set of objects. So even though there's an infinite number, if there's a nice grading on your category and you have this cohomology class, so that will assign a group element to every edge, I can grab that group element and select a set of symbols that live in that graded piece and if that's finite, then I'll have at least a way of choosing a finite set of labels. The other problem is that all these modules, like if we want to use those V alphas that I just taught you about, those, those uh, all have quantum dimension zero. And you look and try a Vero formula and you see that uh, these are all zero, so that it's not, we're gonna have to fix that. So the idea is, this idea is familiar to anyone who's computed the Alexander polynomial you know, by this cut presentation. It's like the Alexander polynomial, when you compute it, you always get zero, you have to cut it, and, what, and, and so we're gonna do, a, there's a similar idea, a notion of a modified trace that we're gonna use to, uh, to fix this problem. This idea of a modified trace has been studied, but like in the context of Tri of Vero, these were the people that were studying it, but this modified trace seems like it's a very powerful idea that's been developed, and in particular like, uh, like Anna and Gene Tudorov and one of the, Dorenze, Marco, They've connected these things to uh, like symmetrized integrals on a Hopf algebra. So modified trace has a nice, uh, is a concept that clearly has a very lot of applications. And then the third problem is, I told you, as soon as we have the one four move, we're semi-simple. So how are we gonna have a topological invariant if it can't satisfy the one four move? And the idea is that we're gonna treat some edges in the triangulation differently. So I'll, I'll explain this in a minute we're gonna require there to be something called a Hamiltonian link inside of our triangulation. And this is some link that hits every edge exactly once. And what we're gonna do is treat the edges that are in the link differently from the edges that are not in the link. So, sorry, that? Hit every vertex once, thank you. Yeah, that's what I, should, that's what I meant to say. So, so the idea is just treat these link edges different than the, than the edges and then we're not really satisfying the one four move because we're satisfying the one four move with this link embedded inside it. So we're, we're cheating. This is how we're cheating. I mean, we had to cheat some way. This is, this is the way we do it. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you how to fix all these problems and I may go a little quickly just to get to the fun parts, but uh, that, those are the three problems that we have to solve or that Gear, Patro, Morand, and Taraev had to solve and they solved it. So in this example of SL2, the idea is there's a grading coming from uh, C mod 2Z. The idea is like grade the category by the weights that show up in it. But you know, if, if G is a weight in a representation, then so is G plus two and G plus four. So what we should really take is, um, that's why this G mod 2Z shows up, or this C mod 2Z. Um, so I don't, this part it gets a little technical and I'm gonna cheat a little bit. But so I, let me just kind of, I just want to give the big picture. So if I restrict to those representations that have certain weights, like in C mod 2Z, then in, then in that case there will be a finite number of those simple objects. These, these V alpha up through V alpha plus 2R minus 1, these will be some finite set of simples that live in that specific graded piece where the grading is by this C mod 2Z, almost. And then if I'm given a cohomology class, I can think of that cohomology class as coloring every edge of my triangulation by G, by elements of the group. So now every edge has, a, has a, some element of this G in it. And so I can use it to help me decide which set of simples to use. I'm only gonna label this edge by the simples that show up in that specific graded piece. So that's how I get to a finite set of objects even though there's an infinite set of simples. The idea for the modified dimension or fixing that, the fact that all of these things are giving dimension zero is if you find some simple object in your, in your uh, closed graph, you can cut it and now you have an endomorphism of a simple object. And so in particular, you get a scalar um, and we just take, the, we take that scalar to be the dimension. Um, this is, like I said, very similar to what you see in the Alexander polynomial. So the, the definition of a modified modified trace or modified dimension, we're gonna pick some subset of simples of our category. It doesn't have to necessarily be 
all the simples, but at least on some subset of the simples, we need a map from the, that set into C, non-zero, hopefully. It should be the same on a vector and its dual, on a, on a representation and its dual. If two representations are isomorphic, you should get the same answer. And this one is the one that when I first saw it, I thought, well, how in the heck are you ever going to check that? You want it to be the case that if you cut any ribbon along two different simples, that you get the same answer. Um, so it's like, it shouldn't depend on where I cut it. And you need to check that for every single ribbon graph that ever existed. So just ch once you're done checking, let me know, and then we'll know we have a dimension. Luckily, these guys didn't you know, just write this definition. They came up with a bunch of technology to help you actually prove that something's a modified dimension. So even though this, to me, seemed a very intimidating definition, you can actually develop tools to show that, that this, this condition here would be satisfied. It, essentially, it doesn't matter where you cut. And so in example, this, this SL2 example, the modified dimension, remember the normal quantum dimension of these things are zero, but the modified dimension looks like this, q to the alpha minus q to, so with this r here. So we get a, something non-zero, but something which can sometimes be negative. And then we also include this data of a Hamiltonian link inside of our triangulation, hits every vertex once, and the idea is that if, it, if we have a manifold with boundary, then this, this thing will be a graph instead of a knot or a link. But we, um, and we'll, for simplicity, we can assume that this graph is hitting the boundary transversely. So there's no link edges that are on the surface on the boundary for convenience. And so the idea is basically just like, oh, let's just introduce some different function B that satisfies whatever properties we need them to satisfy. I don't really want to go into the details, but Basically, if you find some map B which satisfies this, and you use B instead of D when you're doing the tri of zero, then you can get one four Pochner. This thing right here is what you need to get the analog of the one four Pochner move. And you get the one four Pochner move, and you get, you get invariance. So this is the, the, the result that uh, Gear, Patero, Morand, and Triev came up with. Um, if you're given what's called the G relative spherical category, so this is the data of something almost like a spherical category that has this grading like we talked about and this modified dimension and all that stuff. Then we're going to get an invariant of the triple, which is the manifold, the link inside it, and the cohomology class. Um, and the definition is, is like this. Um, you use D on the edges that are not in the link, you use B in the edges that are in the link, and you take the 6J symbol, not the normal 6J symbol, but the 6J symbol where you evaluate it using the modified dimension. Because actually those other 6J symbols I think would have been zero, they would have been zero um, before. So now if you use the modified trace, you get, uh, get well-defined 6J symbols. And they showed that this is a topological, an invariant of this triple. And people have basically not been looking, right after this, you know, they started developing the Rush and Tariah version of the story where you take a link and surgery on a link. And that theory developed, that's where all those cool applications I was telling you about came from. So to try a Vero hasn't really been studied, but we know that those other uh, Rush and Tariah invariants are, are very rich. So I think there's a reason to think that this um, modified try of Vero could be interesting. And that's a, this is the version that we tried to apply to topological phases. So let me just finish up with this, uh, just sort of tell you, how do we change this story? We still have the same, so let, let's build a, now we're going to use a non-semi-simple category to build a Levin-Wynn model. So the vertex operators, they stay the same. The presence of the link miss, messes with those plaquette operators. So one thing that I told you was that we assume that on the boundary, the, there's no link edges on the boundary. So it's like basically this link is going transverse to the surface at every single point. That's just a simplifying assumption, but it's convenient. So if you think about it, what happens if I add a new vertex in this construction? Well, there used to be a link at P that was sort of going transverse at that point. If I add a new point, where is my link going to go? Remember, the link has to hit every vertex of the triangulation. So this new edge that I added had to be labeled by the link if I'm going to build an operator like via this non-semi-simple Tariah Vero. So when I stick on this new thing, all these other edges will be not labeled by the link. 
But this guy going down the middle, because the link has to hit every edge once, that has to be labeled by the link. And so the plaquette operators are just as before, where we define them as what the Taraya Vero invariant assigns to this, except for because that edge is labeled by a, by a link, we use that B instead of the D. And I mean, it seems, I mean, it's very subtle. If you haven't thought about this, who cares? But I mean, the main thing is that like, you really need these two different things. You need a modified quantum dimension and this operator B that, that, that takes track of the link. If you had stuck a D here, your, pla your plaquette operator would have been nilpotent. You wouldn't have been able to build a projector. So the, the subtleties of the construction actually play a role in how you define the Hamiltonian. You define the same Hamiltonian and a bunch of things go wrong. <laughs> So, oh, whoops. Uh, sometimes the quantum dimension is negative. This is actually very much a problem because it, it's related to when you start trying to show that things are Hermitian, you, you see that, like, that you can never have a positive definite form. You see that your inner product is not going to be positive definite when you have these negative quantum dimensions. Um, Negative is as bad as it gets. Well, okay, one thing is we restrict to uh, simples that are labeled by alpha real. So we do have to restrict alpha to be real. So we're, we're, we're forgetting a lot of complex things. Um, but there's something weird about our, our, our system is that it, it does have a positive spectrum, the, the Hamiltonian that we write down. It does have a positive spectrum. There, there is a way to like, think about normalizable wave functions, but it's not Hermitian. Uh, it turns out there's a notion um, that physicists have considered. It's called pseudo-Hermitian to, ex I don't know what happened to my transitions. <laughs> uh, pseudo-Hermitian is exactly this phenomenon. Even going back to Dirac and Pauli, they were considering like uh, quantum mechanics where you had an indefinite inner product. Um, and more recently, physicists have been interested in, you know, I grew up thinking like you're not doing quantum mechanics unless you're doing, your Hamiltonian has to be Hermitian so that your things are real. But more recently, people have been looking at things like PT symmetric quantum mechanics, where you relax the condition that the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, and you just require it to be PT symmetric. So there's all sorts of investigations into relaxing. Because, like I say, we can get real, we have a positive real spectrum, even though our Hamiltonian wasn't Hermitian. So there's this, there's this theory about this, and, the, and this pseudo Hermitian is basically, you, you, you assume you have some invertible Hermitian operator H on your Hilbert space that once you conjugate by that map, then it's Hermitian. So you kind of define your Hermitian adjoint as a slightly different thing. It's, it's H, but conjugated by this eta. So this is what it means to be pseudo-Hermitian. And with this definition, your states are still going to evolve via the Schrodinger equation. Um, you, you can rewrite this story as instead of having a positive definite inner product, you can use eta to define a different inner product that's um, indefinite. So it's kind of like doing quantum mechanics with an indefinite inner product, but um, in some very controlled way by eta. And the theorem is that this levin wen Hamiltonian is an exactly solvable commuting projector Hamiltonian that's pseudo-Hermitian when uh, we have to add some, we need to prove some Hermitian structure on those modules V alpha, because we, we still need some kind of Hermitian property. It's not gonna be unitary because we're never gonna get positive definite, but we do need Hermitian property on our category. And to prove that, we needed to go back and look at the quantum group and show that these V alphas had some Hermitian structure. And it was nice because we could go back to an old paper of uh, Hans and, uh, and just rough, basically just copy his ideas. There's an old paper where he does this for a normal quantum group and shows that that category is Hermitian um, using the key idea is this half twist, which enables you to take Hermitian structure on V, a Hermitian structure on W, and produce a Hermitian structure on V tensor W in some consistent way. So basically, I, I don't think he quite considered the V alphas that had the quantum dimension zero, but basically the same idea could, could work. So we, we adapted his proof got the Hermitian structure, and using that, we produced these pseudo-Hermitian Hamiltonians. So that's the end.
Yes, sorry, a very naive question. Uh, what is this uh, interpretation of the Pentagon equation of the Pachnav moves in this uh, topological phase models? Um, well, in Levin Wen's paper, they contribute the Pentagon as like a consistency relation. Like, so they try to build up everything by just looking at strings labeled by certain things, but then they want a certain consistency. And when you draw something that looks like the Pentagon equation with graphs, you know, like a, a branch with four, four branches and different ways of applying associator, you see that you need a consistency relation. So at least in Levin Wen's paper, they build the, the, the yeah, out of consistency. So, so this is not some kind of integrability condition? Or no, 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 not, no, no. Okay, thank yeah. you. So I can repeat the question, go ahead. case for SL2 you get uh, R minus 1. Simple objects, how many do you get in the SL2 case, for example, to compare? Uh, the, you, you still get R in each, in each, for each edge you get R, R, R minus 1. R minus 1? Yeah, it was like R minus 1, yeah. And what's the definition of the category, non-semi-simple category that you use, for example, in SL2 case? Representations of SL2, the whole, like at a... Fine dimensional? Finite dimensional mm -hmm. representation. Yeah. So with, with, with filtrations by baby vermas, something like this? Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it's a totally natural category. It's just like, it's more unnatural to throw away all those V alphas, you know, to get, uh, if you insisting on having semi-simplicity. But I think what you throw away also, it's the relation KR equal to zero. This is, so you're not anymore in quantum SL2. Because otherwise, you will never have complex weight. In the moment you have kr, k to some integer equal to zero, you will never have complex weight. Did I have k to the r equals one? I thought that's, that, that's one more step. I always get confused with these quantum groups because it's like there's quantum group at a unit unity, there's quantum group at a unity with e to the r, f to the r zero, and then there's quantum group at unit unity with that, and k to the r is something. I don't think we took the k to the r. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And this is called an unrolled quantum group, so it's usually, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I know there's like small, semi, small, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. And then there's restricted. Okay. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, any other questions? If not, then let us think Aaron again.